For as long as I can remember, hiking has been my greatest passion. There's just something so incredibly calming about being immersed in nature. Inhaling the crisp air, standing among majestic trees. Growing up in California allowed me to spend endless weekends exploring state and national parks. But after what happened last summer, the thought of setting foot in the woods again sends shivers down my spine. It started with a solo trip to Kings Canyon National Park. I had a week off work and wanted to clear my head. I packed my gear, loaded my car, and set off early in the morning, eager to escape the city's noise and chaos. The first few days, they were perfect. I hiked for miles, snapping photos of the breathtaking scenery, camping under the stars, paradise. The park was relatively empty, which suited me just fine. I enjoyed the peace and quiet, the feeling of being entirely alone in the wilderness. On the third day, I decided to venture off the beaten path. I'd heard about a hidden waterfall, a local secret, not marked on any map. A ranger had mentioned it in passing, and I couldn't resist the challenge. I followed a barely discernible trail, pushing through dense underbrush, the sound of rushing water growing louder with each step. After a couple of hours, I found it, a stunning cascade of water tumbling into a crystal clear pool. I set up camp nearby, planning to spend the night there. Then, as the sun dipped below the horizon, long shadows being cast through the trees, I built a small fire and settled in for the evening. But that's when things started to go south. It began with the feeling of being watched. At first, I shrugged it off as paranoia. I know the woods can play tricks on your mind, especially when you're alone. But the sensation grew stronger, more unsettling. I scanned the tree line, but saw nothing. Just darkness and the flickering glow of my fire. Then I heard it. A soft rustling, like footsteps in the underbrush. I froze, listening intently. The sound stopped. I convinced myself it was an animal. Maybe a deer or a raccoon. But deep down, I knew something just wasn't right. I decided to turn in early, hoping a good night's sleep would ease my nerves. I crawled into my tent, zipping it tight. The forest was eerily quiet, the only sound the distant roar of the waterfall. I lay there, straining to hear any sound of movement. Hours passed, and I finally drifted into an uneasy sleep. Then my eyes snapped open at the sound of hushed whispers. They were faint and fairly incomprehensible, like voices being carried through the breeze. Panic began to grip me as I strained to make out what was being said. The whispering grew louder and clearer, almost a chattering now, and it seemed as if it was surrounding my tent from all directions. I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped the tent, shining the beam into the darkness. The whispers stopped abruptly as if someone had flipped a switch. I scanned the area, but saw nothing. No movement, no sign of anyone, or anything, nearby. I retreated into my tent, clutching the flashlight like a lifeline. Sleep was now impossible. I lay there, every muscle tense, listening for any hint of the whispers returning. As dawn finally broke, I emerged from the tent, Bleary-eyed and exhausted, the forest looked different in the daylight, less menacing, more serene. I convinced myself it had all been some kind of fever dream, product of my over-imagination. I started to break down my tent and make my way back to the main trail. However, as I was packing up, I stumbled upon something that sent shivers down my spine. Footprints. Human footprints circling my campsite. They were fresh, bare feet, the impressions deep in the soft earth, and there were dozens of them all around my tent, leading into the woods. The panic returned. I grabbed my gear and started hiking back, moving as quickly as I could. The feeling of being watched, though, it returned,
stronger than ever. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see someone, or something, following me. But the forest, it remained still, silent. By the time I reached the main trail, I was drenched in sweat, my nerves frayed. I didn't stop until I reached the parking lot, practically sprinting the last couple of miles. I threw my gear in the car and sped out of the park, not looking back. But for weeks after, I couldn't shake that feeling of unease. I had nightmares about those whispers and those footprints. I tried to rationalize it, telling myself I must have blown it out of proportion. But deep down, I knew there was something more to it. A few months later, I stumbled across an old forum thread about strange occurrences in California's state and national parks. People shared stories of encountering feral people, wild, untamed humans living deep in the wilderness, avoiding contact with the outside world. The descriptions matched my experience, the whispers, the feelings of being watched, the multitude of bare footprints. One post, in particular, caught my eye. It was from a former ranger who claimed to have encountered these feral people. He described them as almost animalistic, living in hidden communities, fiercely territorial. He warned that those who ventured too close often disappeared without a trace. It explained everything, the whispers, the footprints, the sense of being followed, of being hunted. I'd stumbled into their territory, and they'd been watching me, deciding whether I was a threat or possibly a meal. I've been back to the woods since. The thought of those wild, unseen eyes watching me from the shadows is enough to keep me away. I traded my hiking boots for city streets, my love of nature tainted by fear. Sometimes, late at night, it's like I can still hear those whispers, faint, just on the edge of my hearing. And I wonder, did they follow me back? Are they still watching me? waiting for just the right moment to strike. So, if you ever find yourself alone in the woods and you hear whispers, run, don't look back, because once they've marked you, they won't stop until they have you. And in the depths of California's forest, no one will hear you scream. I never should have gone hiking alone in that state park. I thought I knew those trails like the back of my hand. I'd been exploring them since I was a kid, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered that day. It started off like any other solo hike. I parked my car at the trailhead, double-checked that I had plenty of water and snacks, and set off into the tranquil peace of the woods. The sun shone through the towering redwood as birds chirped overhead. I breathed in the fresh, piney air, feeling totally at ease and at peace. About two miles in, though, I reached a fork in the trail that I'd never noticed before. Puzzled, I pulled out my trail map, but this diverging path wasn't shown. Strange, I thought. But, against my better judgment, I decided to see where this mysterious trail led. This narrow path was more overgrown clearly not well-traveled like the main trails. Low-hanging branches scraped my face as I pushed through. An eerie silence settled over the forest, usual bird calls replaced by an unsettling stillness. Then the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Something felt very wrong. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream ripped through the trees, echoing off the distant hills. My heart nearly stopped. It sounded like a person, shrieking in terror or pain. Then another horrific wail joined the first, and another. This unholy chorus grew louder, to the point that it sounded almost inhuman, like injured animals crying out. Pure dread washed over me in waves. I spun around to run back the way I came, but froze in my tracks. There. Blocking the path behind me stood three emaciated human-like figures, 
barely clothed in tattered rags. The skin was caked in dirt and what looked like blood, and they crouched down like wild animals. Most unnerving of all, though, their eyes were totally dark and empty, devoid of any humanity. They stared right at me, their lips curling back to reveal jagged, blackened teeth. Low, guttural snarls escaped their throats. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. Sheer terror glued me in place as they slowly crept forward, their malevolent, dark eyes locked on mine. A putrid stench of decay hit my nostrils, causing me to gag. I watched in a petrified disbelief as one stretched out a gnarled hand tipped with ragged nails, reaching for me, its gruesome face splitting into an insane grin. At last, my paralysis broke and I bolted, crashing wildly through the brush, not caring where I was going as long as it was far away from those feral abominations. All I could hear was the blood rushing in my ears and the demented shrieks of those horrors giving chase close behind me. Thorny branches tore at my skin and clothes, but I didn't care. I didn't even slow down. By some miracle, I burst out onto one of the main trails and sprinted the remaining distance back to the trailhead in record time, not once looking behind me. I jumped in my car, slammed the locks down, and sped out of there like a bat out of hell. Only once I reached the safety of the main road did I finally dare to glance in my rearview mirror. The road behind me was empty. No sign of any ferals. What I saw in those woods that day still haunts me. The Park Service claims they've never had any reports of feral people living in the state park. They say I must have imagined it or mistaken normal hikers for something else. But I know what I saw. Those things, they weren't human. Not anymore. Their predatory shrieks and dead soulless eyes are seared into my mind. I did some digging and found reports buried in obscure corners of the internet from hikers who encountered something similar in state and national parks across California. Yes, feral humans. More animal than man. Stalking the deepest reaches of the wilderness. Now, these stories are quickly dismissed as hoaxes or hallucinations, but me, I know the truth. Those creatures are out there, waiting. I've never gone hiking again, and I never will, because now I know we're not the only ones wandering those woods. Now, I've always been a city kid, born and raised in the concrete jungle of Los Angeles. But last summer, I decided to step out of my comfort zone and explore the natural beauty of some of California's state and national parks. Little did I know, the wilderness held more than just scenic views and fresh air. It all started when I embarked on a solo backpacking trip to the Sequoia National Park. The first day was uneventful, filled with the usual awe-inspiring sights of towering trees and crystal-clear streams. I set up camp as the sun began to set. The silence of the forest, broken only by the occasional chirp of a cricket or the hoot of an owl. As I lay in my tent, I felt a strange sensation of being watched. I shrugged it off as nerves, a common side effect of city dwellers adjusting to the wilderness. But as the night wore on, the feeling intensified. Suddenly, I heard rustling in the bushes, what sounded like soft footsteps and quiet voices that seemed to echo from every direction. The next morning, I found footprints around my campsite. They were bare, human-like, but with a strange, almost animalistic quality to them. I suddenly felt a chill as I realized I wasn't alone out here. I decided to cut my trip short and head back to civilization. But as I packed up, I noticed a figure watching me from the edge of the forest. It was human but wild and unkempt, with long, matted hair and eyes that glinted with a primal intensity. It disappeared as soon as I made eye contact, leaving me with an unsettling feeling of dread. I hiked back to my car as quickly as I could, but the feeling of being watched never left me. 
I heard more voices, more footsteps, and saw more figures darting between the trees. By the time I reached my car, I was in a state of near panic. I thought, well, that'd be the end of that, but I was wrong. Over the next few weeks, I heard stories of other hikers encountering similar figures in other parks all across California. They spoke of wild, feral people living in the depths of the forest, surviving off the land and avoiding contact with civilization. If you think about it, everything you need is out there. If you know what you're doing, you have food, water, and shelter. Rudimentary, but it's there. Now, I tried to dismiss these stories as urban legends, but I couldn't shake off the memories of my own encounter. I decided to investigate further, delving into the history of California's parks and the legends surrounding them. What I found was chilling. There were tales of lost hikers stumbling upon entire communities of these feral people, living in caves and makeshift shelters. Some were said to be descendants of early settlers who had chosen to live off the grid, while others were rumored to even be survivors of plane crashes or other disasters. But the most disturbing part was the stories of violence, tales of hikers disappearing without a trace, of campsites being totally ransacked, and of strange animalistic howls echoing through the night. I don't know what I encountered in Sequoia National Park. I don't know if the other stories are true, or if they are just the product of overactive imaginations. But what I do know is that there's more to California's wilderness than meets the casual eye. So if you're planning a trip to the Golden States Parks, remember this. You're not just sharing the land with bears and deer and big cats. You're sharing it with something else. Something wild and unpredictable. And if you hear voices in the night or feel eyes watching you from the darkness, don't look back. Just keep walking. Because some things are better left unseen. The air hung thick and heavy, saturated with a scent of pine needles and damp earth. A symphony of unseen creatures chirped and buzzed in the undergrowth. Their nocturnal chorus, a constant reminder that we were far from alone in Yosemite National Park. Far from the bustling crowds and selfie sticks, my brother Mark and I had ventured deep into the heart of the wilderness, seeking solace in the solitude of nature. However, we found something else entirely. It began suddenly, like a discordant note in a harmonious melody, a flash of movement in the periphery, too quick to discern, the unsettling feeling of being observed, that prickling at the back of your neck. We dismissed it initially, attributing it to overactive imaginations fueled by campfire stories and the inky black oppressive darkness. But as we hiked deeper, the unsettling occurrences intensified. Our first real sign of trouble was the discovery of a crudely fashioned shelter, woven from branches and leaves hidden amongst the towering redwoods. It was primitive, almost animalistic, and it stunk of an unsettling musk that raised the hairs on my neck. Mark, ever pragmatic, suggested it was probably just a homeless person seeking refuge. But the unease in his voice mirrored my own growing apprehension. Later that day, as the sun began to go down, we stumbled upon something far more disturbing. A mutilated deer carcass lay sprawled across the trail, its eyes vacant and glassy, its flesh torn and ravaged in a way that made me ill. The stench of decay was overpowering but it was the almost surgical precision of the wounds that truly unsettled me. This was no wild animal attack. That night, huddled around a flickering campfire, the silence of the wilderness was shattered by a scream, a gut-wrenching primal scream, filled with a raw terror that sent a jolt of adrenaline coursing through our veins. Mark and I exchanged a look, our faces etched with a mixture of fear and disbelief. 
Grabbing our flashlights, we cautiously approached the source of the sound, our hearts pounding in our chests. But we found nothing. No source for the scream, no sign of a struggle, no trace of blood. Just the oppressive silence of the woods, heavier now, pregnant with unseen menace. We returned to our campsite, our nerves frayed. The image of that mutilated deer burned into our minds. Sleep that night was a fleeting visitor, punctuated by nightmares of glowing eyes and guttural growls. The next morning, we mutually agreed to cut our trip short. The events of the previous day had cast a pall over our adventure, replacing our awe with a gnawing sense of dread. As we packed up our gear, I noticed something glinting in the early morning light. It was a crudely fashioned spear, its tip carved from bone, lying seemingly discarded near a campsite. It was then that the horrifying truth dawned on me. We weren't alone. Something was stalking us. Our descent back to civilization became a desperate flight for survival. Every rustle of leaves, every snapping twig, sent our pulses racing. We moved with a frantic urgency, our backpacks feeling heavier with each passing moment. The forest, once a source of peace and tranquility, had now transformed into a menacing labyrinth, its beauty overshadowed by an overwhelming sense of doom. As dusk approached, we stumbled upon an old ranger station, its windows boarded up, its paint peeling like scabs. Desperation beat out caution, and we broke in, hoping to find a phone, a weapon, anything to aid us in our desperate situation. The interior was thick with dust and cobwebs, the air stale and heavy. As I rummaged through an old file cabinet, I found a tattered journal, its pages filled with frantic, barely legible scrawls. The journal belonged to a park ranger who had been stationed in Yosemite years ago. His entries started normally enough, detailing mundane park activities and wildlife sightings. But as his days turned into weeks, a chilling transformation took place in his writing. He wrote of strange occurrences, of missing hikers, of mutilated animal carcasses found deep in the woods. He described seeing fleeting glimpses of humanoid figures lurking in the shadows, their eyes glowing with an unnatural intensity. He called them the Ancient Ones. The ranger's entries grew increasingly paranoid, his writing more frantic and disjointed. He believed that these creatures were not merely animals, but something far more sinister, something that had once been human, but had devolved into something primal, something monstrous. He wrote of being hunted, of being watched, of a terror that seeped into his very being. The last entry, scrawled in a shaky hand, simply read, They are everywhere. They are watching. They are coming. Then a blood-curdling scream from outside ripped me from the journal. I spun around, my heart pounding against my ribs, to see Mark being dragged away from the window by a grotesque figure. It was vaguely humanoid, but its skin was stretched taut over its bones, its eyes glowing with a predatory hunger. Its teeth, jagged and black, were bared in a feral snarl as it dragged Mark deeper into the forest, the screams echoing through the trees. Paralyzed by fear, I could only watch in horror as my brother was swallowed by the darkness. Then silence. A silence more terrifying than any scream. I knew then that I was utterly alone, and being hunted by these creatures that were once upon a time human, but now twisted and warped by something sinister lurking in the heart of this once pristine wilderness. I don't know how long I stayed in that abandoned ranger station. The journal clutched in my trembling hands, the dying screams of my brother echoing in my ears. Day blurred into night, each moment a terrifying dance with my own sanity. I knew I had to escape, to warn others, but the fear was paralyzing. Eventually, driven by a primal need to survive, I fled the ranger station. I ran through the forest, fueled by pure adrenaline and terror the image of my brother's fate etched into my mind. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs screamed for mercy, 
till the forest around me was a blur of green and brown. I emerged from the wilderness a changed man, haunted by the horrors I'd witnessed. My story was met with skepticism, dismissed as the ramblings of a traumatized hiker who had lost his brother. But I know the truth. Deep in the heart of Yosemite, something sinister lurks, something feral and hungry. And it's only a matter of time before it claims its next victim or victims. So just remember when you go out into the wilderness, beware of the shadows. You're not alone. The awe inspiring natural beauty and ruggedness of California's parks has always captivated me. From Yosemite to Sequoia to Joshua Tree, I've trekked through them all, camping along the way. The sense of tranquility that comes from being surrounded by towering trees and unspoiled wilderness, far from the hustle and bustle of society, used to be something I cherished. But after what happened last summer, my perspective on these majestic parks will never, ever be the same. It was early August, and I'd taken a week off work for a solo backpacking trip in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I planned an ambitious 50-mile loop, starting and ending at a remote trailhead. The first couple of days were blissful. Warm sunshine, breathtaking vistas of granite peaks, refreshing swims in crystal-clear lakes. I didn't see another soul. Pure heaven. On the third night, I made camp in a small clearing surrounded by lodgepole pines. After cooking dinner on my camp stove, I sat on a log and watched the sun sink below the soft tooth ridges, streaking the sky with brilliant oranges and pinks. The air turned cool and I zipped up my fleece, content in the stillness. Suddenly, a sound in the gathering darkness made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It was a human voice, but not quite. More animalistic. A cross between a moan and a shriek. It sounded close, maybe only a hundred yards away through the trees. Hello? I called out tentatively. Is someone there? No response, but another chilling howl. I told myself, eh, must be a coyote or a mountain lion, but I knew it wasn't. I retreated into my tent, zipping it tight with trembling hands. I tried to steady my breathing and reassure myself that I was safe, that it was probably just another hiker. But deep down, I knew better. I laid there for hours, clenching at every rustle of pine needles or snapping of twigs. All I had with me was a hunting knife. Eventually, pure exhaustion overtook me, and I fell into a fitful sleep, tossing and turning. Then I woke with a start in the leaden light just before dawn. I unzipped the tent, and that's when I saw them. Creeping out of the shadows between the pine trees were these emaciated figures, naked except for ragged animal hides. Their matted hair hung in dirty ropes and their skin was caked with filth. But it was their eyes that made my blood turn to ice. These were not ordinary people. With growing horror, I realized they were stalking towards my tent, slowly, purposefully, like a pack of wolves circling wounded prey. I screamed, an involuntary sound ripped from my throat. They froze. All eyes on me now. For a moment, we stared at each other, a huge gap of civilization between us. Then they charged. I've never moved so fast in my life. In a blur of panic, I flew out of my tent and crashed into the underbrush, heedless of the branches slashing my face and arms. I ran like the devil himself was chasing me, and for all I knew, he was my lungs and legs on fire, waiting for the moment that they would overtake me. But it didn't come. After what felt like hours, I stumbled to a stop, gasping, still in my sock feet and boxers. I looked around wildly, but I was alone now in the quiet forest. 
I didn't know what else to do, so I sank to my knees and wept, not even caring how I would find my way back without map or boots. All I could think was that I had narrowly escaped with my life. From what? I still wasn't entirely sure. Once the adrenaline wore off, I started trying to second-guess myself. Maybe it'd been a nightmare, my tired mind playing tricks on me in unfamiliar surroundings. By the light of day, feral primitives stalking me seemed impossible. Still, I made my way slowly and painfully back to my campsite, trying to follow my own footprints in the soft dirt. Quite a sight awaited me. My tent was shredded, the remnants strewn about the clearing as if by a tornado. My backpack was gutted, clothes and gear scattered. Of my food, only the torn packaging remained. It was like a bear had gone berserk, or so I tried to tell myself. But I couldn't shake the memory of those savage, staring eyes. With rising nausea, I noticed the footprints ringing my destroyed campsite. Long, narrow, human, but yet warped, the toes strangely splayed. I just abandoned everything, grabbed my boots, ran the distance back to the trailhead in under five hours, ignoring my aching feet and dry mouth. I must have looked deranged when I stumbled up to the rangers, sobbing and hyperventilating. They put me on a bench out back and took my garbled statement, frowning as I described the feral people. When I finished, the two rangers exchanged a long look. Then the older one sighed. You're not the first, he said heavily. Every couple of months, we get a report like this from a hiker, usually in the backcountry. Sightings of people way out in the wilderness, far from trails, naked or wearing animal skins, like they've gone totally native. We call them the ferals, the other ranger added. No one knows for sure who they are or how many are out there. Could be survivalist nuts, addicts, maybe even some of those old hippie communes gone way off the deep end. But the higher-ups don't like us talking about it, the first ranger said. Bad publicity. Most people just assume it's bears or hoaxes or maybe urban legends. But me, I've seen those shredded campsites, the tracks. Something's out there. So what are you going to do about it? I asked, my mouth suddenly dry. The ranchers glanced at each other again. Not much we can do, said the older one. The wilderness, it's a big place. I'd stay out of the backcountry if I were you. Stick to busy campgrounds and always keep your food locked up tight. And if you see them, he slowly shook his head. Pray they're not hungry. I spent months afterwards jumping at shadows, questioning my own memories. I scoured the internet but found only unverified reports on conspiracy forums. Whispers of people living feral in the national forest, more animal than human. Gradually, I convinced myself that the rangers were just messing with me. But then last week, I saw a news article about an alleged grizzly bear attack at a state park campground. A group of four found in a shredded tent. The strange thing was, the victims' bodies were dragged over a mile away, and there were pieces missing, as if something had been eating them along the way. The article quoted a park ranger who wished to remain anonymous. This anonymous source said, I've never seen anything like that in 20 years on the job. It doesn't make sense. All I can say is, I don't think it was a bear that did this. And suddenly, I was back in that clearing, staring into those hungry, savage eyes. I could almost hear the long, eerie howls echoing through the pines. The ferals are still out there. Oh, yes. I'm certain of it now. Waiting in the pristine wilderness of our parks, watching. So I'm warning you. If you go out into the California backcountry, be careful. Lock up your food. Stay in your tent at night. And never go alone.
because you never know what might be prowling in paradise. Growing up in California, I was lucky to have access to an abundance of natural beauty. My love for the outdoors began at a young age, and my friends and I often spent weekends hiking through state and national parks. We searched for new trails and, and cherished camping under the starry skies. But there was one trip that would forever change my view of these otherwise peaceful landscapes. It was late October, the air crisp and the leaves starting to turn. Perfect weather for a weekend getaway. My friends from school, John, Sam, and I, decided to head to the Mendocino National Forest, the less crowded alternative to the more popular parks. We packed our gear, filled our tank, and set off early on a Friday morning. The drive was uneventful, and by noon, we were deep within the park. We chose a remote campsite near a river, miles away from any other campers. It was perfect. We set up our tents, gathered wood for a fire, and spent the afternoon fishing and just lounging by the water. As dust settled, we built a campfire and cooked our dinner. The stars began to twinkle above us, and the forest around us grew darker and more mysterious. We sat around the fire, sharing stories and laughing, completely unaware that something was watching us from the shadows. It must have been around midnight when we first heard it, a distant, haunting howl. It wasn't the cry of any animal I'd ever heard. It had an almost human quality to it. John and I exchanged uneasy glances, but Sam laughed it off, attributing it to some late-night pranksters. Probably some kids messing around like we used to, she said, poking the fire with a stick. But the sound we'd heard left an unsettling feeling in my gut. We decided to turn in for the night, and I crawled into my tent, zipping it tightly behind me. The forest was eerily quiet now, the only sound being the trees in the breeze. I must have fallen asleep quickly, exhausted from the day's activities. Suddenly, I jolted awake. There was something outside my tent. Whispers, low, guttural, unintelligible. I strained to listen. I glanced at my watch. It was 3.14 a.m. I reached my flashlight and slowly unzipped the tent, peering into the darkness. The fire died down to embers, casting a weak glow around the campsite. I saw nothing out of the ordinary, but those damned whispers continued, seeming to come from all directions. I stepped out of my tent, a flashlight cutting through the darkness. John? Sam? I called softly, hoping they were hearing this too. But there was no response. I moved towards their tents, the whispers growing louder, more insistent. I was getting scared at this point. I reached John's tent and gently rapped on one of the poles. John, you awake? I whispered. No answer. I unzipped his tent and shined my light inside. It was empty. I quickly checked Sam's tent, also empty. Now the panic really started to set in. Guys, this isn't funny, I shouted, the creeping fear evident in my voice. The whispers turned into low growls, and I spun around, my flashlight beam dancing wildly through the trees. That's when I saw them, eyes. Reflective, hungry eyes staring back at me from the darkness, and they seemed to be everywhere, surrounding the campsite. I felt my breath catching my throat. These weren't animals. They were people, or at least they used to be. Their skin was pale and filthy, seemingly just stretched over their bones. Their hair was matted, and the ones that were wearing clothes, it was little more than tattered rags. They moved with a disturbing, animalistic grace, crouching low to the ground. I backed away slowly, my mind racing. Where the hell were John and Sam? Were these things responsible for their disappearance? I had to find them. I suddenly turned and bolted towards the river, hoping they might have fled in that direction. 
but the murmurings and growls followed me, growing louder as I ran. The terrain was rough, and I stumbled several times, scraping my hands and knees, but I didn't stop. I couldn't. I reached the river bank, panting and shaking. The moon cast a ghostly light over the water, and I saw something on the opposite shore, a figure standing still. My heart leapt with hope. John! I called out. As I got closer, I realized it wasn't him. It was Sam. She stood there, motionless, staring blankly at the water. Her clothes were torn, and there were scratches all over her body. Sam, I shouted again, but she didn't respond. I splashed through the shallow water and grabbed her shoulders. Sam, we need to go. Where's John? She slowly turned her head to look at me, her eyes wide with terror. They took him, she whispered in a hoarse voice. They took him into the woods. We have to hide. They'll be back soon. Her words sent a shiver down my spine, confirming my worst fears. I took Sam by the hand, scanning the trees for any sign of movement. We need to find a safe place to hide, I said urgently, guiding Sam away from the riverbank. The whispers and growls still echoed through the night, seemed to be getting closer to us. As we stumbled through the underbrush, I strained to listen for any sound that might betray our pursuers. Suddenly, a blood-curdling howl pierced the air. They were much closer now. I felt a surge of adrenaline as I urged Sam to move faster. The forest seemed to come alive with sinister energy, as if the very trees were watching our every step. We found a small cave hidden among the rocks, barely large enough for us to squeeze inside. Sam huddled close to me as I shifted boulders to block the entrance. The sounds outside grew louder, more menacing, close. What are we going to do, Sam asked, trembling. I didn't have the luxury of time to think. We have to stay quiet and hope they can't find us, I whispered. We huddled together in the darkness, our breathing rapid and shallow. The sounds outside continued, growing more frantic, almost as if they were searching for something. Probably us but they soon fell silent, leaving us in a tense quiet. Hours passed. We listened for the whispers and growls of the creatures that haunted the forest, but they seemed to leave us alone. They weren't lurking outside the cave. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we heard the sound of footsteps approaching. At first, I thought the creatures had returned. But then a faint light pierced through the darkness, casting shadows that danced eerily around us. The footsteps grew closer and we held our breath, unsure of what to expect. Suddenly, some of the boulders I'd piled over the entrance shifted and a flashlight shined in our faces. Two figures appeared, wearing military-style uniforms. They looked relieved to see us. Are you the survivors from the camp? One man asked. I nodded too exhausted and shaken to speak. We've been searching for you, the other one replied. You're not alone. We're here to rescue you and take you to safety. Tears welled up in my eyes as I realized we'd been saved. We emerged from the cave, the cold air hitting us like a slap in the face. But we were alive, and that was all that mattered. As we were led away from the forest, I couldn't help but glance back at the place where we had hidden. Despite the relief of being saved, a part of me remained haunted by the memories of the voices, growls, and terrifying creatures we'd encountered. I knew it would take time to heal from the trauma that we'd endured, but also knew that whatever we'd faced in those woods was a nightmare that none of us would forget. Life would never be the same again. Be careful out there. <laughs>